Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, thanks for coming with me on that. Whenever time I try to teach, um, I believe fully in, in getting in the spirit. You know, it's so hard for me to disconnect from the world and kind of my thinking um, and worship, you know, does that for me. And I, and I, and I like that song and it's going to tie into a lot of what we're talking about tonight and it's it's welcoming the holy spirit here that it would fill this atmosphere uh and in this room um so as we come here today i would just ask that um brian kind of blew my world up today i'd gotten ahead i knew i was going to be teaching on first corinthians 2 and so I had prepared some things, and I was ready to go last week, and I told Amy, I said, I felt I was ready to go. And then I kind of was sharing with him by happenstance. He came by on Wednesday, and I was kind of walking through what I was going to share, and he's like, all right, all right. But I shared one aspect of it, and he goes, have you ever heard of this thing? And it's talking about the secret plan, God's secret plan, and the hidden mystery of God. And I'm like, well, well wait a minute, what are you talking about? He says, man, I read this thing, and he gave me... Uh, this to read, which is the mystery hidden for Aeon's past, and I started to read it, read it, and my mind was blown. It opened up the the Bible to me and scriptures in a whole new way, and uh, so I had to reorient everything. But see, the Spirit works that way. See, the Spirit works through people. See, Brian is a Holy Spirit filled man. And the Lord knew that I was going to be teaching here, and my heart was in it. But I, I believe as I had prepared and I had shared that he said, Hey, Lance, I have, a, I have a new thing for you this morning. And so if you'll come with me, I've spent a lot of time in this, as Amy would know, because what happened was I got super excited, and I was running all up and down the scriptures as I read. This is 21 pages of deep stuff. And there's stuff that isn't in here that I was just reminding of what was being lit up. And I was like, oh, my gosh, then there's this. And I would read this and like, oh, my gosh, then there's that. And uh, so I'm excited. I'm thankful that, that Brian, one of the reasons why I'm here is I believe God's given me a, a mentor in, in Brian to help me. And I call him, he's a Bible teacher. And, and although I've been through seminary, we've been through the same things, that there's areas that I need that. So... Um, it's not as slick as I would have wanted it. I don't have everything in the, in the slides as I would want it. Last night I was going too long, so I'm going to go old school, and we're going to get in some Bible stuff. And I, I'm just going to trust that the Spirit is going to move today and that we're going to hear what God wants us to hear today. So I'm thankful you guys allowed me, me to worship in that song, and I hope it meant something to you. So we're in 1 Corinthians 2, and we'll set the stage. So last week Brian talked about um, the Corinthian church, and we need to understand uh, where Corinth was. It was a city that had been destroyed, but it built back up. And it was a natural port city, okay? It was under Roman rule, but it was in Greek, so very heavily Greek and Roman influenced. It was a unique port because you could come on one side of it, and they could unload the cargo to the other side where they could have to the waterways, and they could shortcut a bunch of times. So it was this booming place, and when you have Rome and you have uh, Greeks around, it's kind of a wild party place too, right? And we have a lot of travelers. So along with that comes uh, the party scene. Think Vegas, okay? So what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. And, but Paul had, had, had come there, and he had been preaching to the Jews, as we saw in Acts, and they weren't really having it, okay? They weren't having this whole thing of Jesus Christ crucified. A few, but he went out and then ultimately... The Gentiles, which are the non-Jews, which I think are most of us, right? He went and started to speak to them and spent some time there, and the church started to explode in Corinth. Paul had left to go off on his journeys, and uh, the Corinthian people had fallen away. The world and the culture had grabbed them, and they had kind of been falling back into their old ways. And so he has to write this letter to them, and, and, and we're going to see as we're studying this throughout that he's going to have to admonish them on a lot of things that they're doing. So right out of the gate, in chapter 1, after he gives Thanksgiving, Brian talked about he hit them with the gospel. He's right. It is about Jesus Christ crucified. Remember what you were about and what Brian drove home, what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 1, is he's talking the cross is the wisdom. 
Jesus Christ dying on the cross, that that is the wisdom. And they called it foolishness, and to the Jews it was a stumbling block, and we're going to come back into that. So as we set that scene today, he comes right back in to 1 Corinthians 2, and he comes right back to this, and he was reminding them, he's taking them right to the beginning. Remember when I came to you, and he's taking them there. And he says, when I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. God's secret plan, hold on to that. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything, everything, except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. Wow. And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> I did this you would trust, not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. You can obviously see, but what I've highlighted here is there's something that he's coming back. You know, when you think about Greeks and Romans, we've probably all seen it, we heard it. They were really impressed by the smart guys, right? They would get out in the middle and it was performance art. Uh, you even hear the term like Corinthian language. So they were really highly impressed with the guys who could use the big words and perform all the stuff. And they're like, whoa. And most of the people were uneducated at this time. So you would see a guy putting on an amazing performance, right? Looks awesome. You could see why people would follow him because he has that charisma, right? That spark, that knack. And so he's speaking to this and he's like going back to the heart. He's like, remember, I didn't do any of those things with you. In the very beginning, I came to you, and I was very plain. I didn't use the smoke of smoke and mirrors. You didn't believe in this cross, this wisdom of God, because I was particularly talented. No. He also points out his physical condition, that I came to you in weakness, timid, and trembling. Think about what we're attracted to, like the people that we want to follow. The people that we put up on pedestals was no different for them as it was for us today. It's the good-looking guy. It's the good-looking gal. It's the strapping person. It's the rock star preacher, right? He's saying, I was none of that. Weakness, timid, and trembling. And he tells us the very end, he did this so they wouldn't trust in this human wisdom. He's setting out this big thing at the beginning in 1 Corinthians 1, and he's driving it home in 1 Corinthians 2. We've got man's wisdom. We've got this stuff that everyone values, but I came back to you, and I did this so you would just trust in God's wisdom. Okay? So corporately, I want us to think about this. There's a couple things that I think make sense. Why is this important to us? One, as a church... We're sitting in an elementary school. <laughs> We're pulling out chairs. We got a speaker in the corner, we got a computer, and we've got a projector. There's a, there's a heart of me that you see. There's a reason why you're here. There is something simple about church. There's a heart of a church that, that is going on. And I think the reason where God has moved me so strongly, and I think where Brian is, and I wanted to. God has just given me an encouragement to him. Is like Paul came to these people, okay, these, these Gentiles, these people, these unbelievers, and he spoke to them very simply and very plainly. And out of that, the church exploded. So as you come here and you see here, and I, my, my thing is I come here, is like this is the picture of what a church that would explode out of. So corporately, I think it's important that we understand this. But individually, I want you guys to hear this. You're qualified to preach the gospel. You're qualified. You don't have to have the fancy words, and you don't have to have it all figured out. Don't you want to tell yourself that I'm not smart enough? Like, I don't have all these degrees. I haven't studied the Bible enough. Boy, I don't speak well in front of people. I've got to get the words right. I want to talk to someone. I want to share. Well, just when I know some more, or I get it all figured out, then I'll do it. No, no, no. I want you to hear something. If you hear something today, I want you to know you're qualified. People aren't saved because of an intellectual persuasion and wisdom. What saves them, and he gets to this heart of this now, it is the Holy Spirit 
See, it's the power of the Holy Spirit and the faith-saving grace of the Holy Spirit that grabs a person's heart and saves them and brings them into the wisdom of God. So I want, I want you to know there's freedom in that. You don't have to be perfect, and it's okay if you're weak. It's okay if you're not smart. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're weak, if you're timid, or you're trembling. It doesn't matter if you have some sort of mental illness or physical illness. You have everything you need to share what he talked about, the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ crucified. I want to, another thing that jumped out at me that it says, he really what he's talking about is he's only the gospel. So we go back into this verse two. So he decided when he was with them, and these are Gentiles. These are people that had no idea primarily. There were some Jews, but primarily Gentiles. And he said, for I decided when I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ crucified. Everything. It's a big word. Everything. That means everything. Like everything except Jesus Christ, the one who is crucified. Now, when we read that, those three words, there's a lot in those three words. Jesus, fully man, right? The simple guy, lived in kind of obscurity, was poor, was not part of the elite. God came here in man, God with us, Jesus, Emmanuel, right? But the Christ, Christos, the Messiah, the chosen one, God here on earth, Jesus, the man came. He was the Messiah, God here on earth, the one who was crucified, the suffering servant that went to us to atone for our sins. The Messiah was the suffering servant who was crucified. Whoa. You know, when you think about the imagery of the day for crucifixion, and we, we saw it in chapter 1, and you need to put yourself in their heads now, you know, crucifixions were invented by the Romans, and so if you would have been alive today, if you would have been a Corinthian, if you'd have been in that time, you would have known, you would have seen crucifixion. The Romans used it. If you stood against Rome, they used to line them up and stack them up. This gruesome murder. And so he's focusing on the crucifixion, the Christ that is crucified. And we see, you know, in the imagery of this, this is what he's in. He's talking about Jesus, right? That's God. That's the Messiah. And he's crucified. To them, that had a real visceral impact. Could you imagine driving on your way to church today and you see 30 people dying in agony as they're strung up, bloody, beaten, scores. I mean, just think about that. That's what they lived in. And by the way, that's his lead, is this. We drive this home. Man's wisdom, we see it in 1 Corinthians 1, is to the Jews, it offended them. In fact, he uses the word, it was a stumbling block, right? Jesus the, Christ, the Messiah crucified? No way. No way. It was a stumbling block to them. He's driving this home. And they're living amongst Jews. We know there was a synagogue in Corinth because he taught there and they didn't accept him. So I guarantee as they've fallen astray, he's coming right back against them. And he's reminding them, this is what man's wisdom into the Jews. It's an offense and it's a stumbling block. And we're going to blow that up today. And to the Gentiles, it's foolishness. Brian had the picture of, of the cross, an early picture, and it was a picture of a man crucified, and he had the ass, right? It's like, your God's an ass. And by the way, the implication is, you're an ass for believing in him that way. Do we hear that today? If you hear that, is it we in a similar place today? When Jesus was on the cross, we see that the people were up there and they were mocking him. Hey, Jesus, you're, if you're God, get yourself down from there, right? The Romans put king of the Jews and are poking fun at him throughout the day. Even one of the criminals say, yeah, hey, hey, Jesus, if you really are this Messiah guy, get yourself down and take me with you. It's foolishness to them. But as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 1, as he's talking about here today, when he's talking about God's wisdom, right? 
Jesus Christ crucified, taught to us by God's own Holy Spirit. That is the wisdom of God. All right. We're going to spend some time as we go down next in 1 Corinthians 1. And this is the thing that rocked my world this week. Okay? And so I've been through seminary. Uh, I've read this stuff. I've heard some things. But it was never described to me in the way that, that I'm going to talk about it here today. Because there's something really awesome that's going on here in 1 Corinthians 2. It takes place in other places in the Bible. We hear them refer to this hidden mystery and so on and so forth. I had always... I knew that there was uh, that there were things going on with this, but they, people just kind of gloss over it. And I was okay with the glossing over it, and in fact, because it didn't affect some things. But understanding this now really allows the scriptures to become alive, and you can see things in a whole new light. So this is 20 pages, and this is where you're going to come with me, is I'm trying to just stay at the, the height of it, the top level, and kind of give you some things that we'll talk about here. I'm going to use some scriptures to go through this, but this is kind of like I've told Brian, like this would be an amazing side study for those of us who are interested to really get in and kind of uh, to un unwind this. But we're going to stay at the top and the surface, and I hope the Lord has given me a simple and plain way to talk about this today through his Holy Spirit. We see right out of the gate in 1 Corinthians 2, we had already read, pre read previously, he said, When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. It's a secret plan. He goes on after he said that, where I said I relied only on the Holy Spirit, that yet when I'm among mature believers, now think about that, mature believers. Let's take a step to think about that. Mature believers. He's not leading with this secret stuff when he's going talking to the unbelievers right out of the gate, but he had met with them, and after they had come to believe, he's like, okay, now I'm going to tell you some more stuff, some deeper stuff. So what we're talking about here today, I don't want to confuse it that I believe a lot of us here spend some time, we're assuming to ask Brian, we're mature believers. So this is, a, this is kind of a next level thing, a deeper thing, um, and I hope for those of us that it will give us a new and an exciting way to, to read and have the scriptures reveal things to us. Um, if you aren't a believer, I think it's still pretty awesome, but I don't want you to get caught up in all this and we can do this, but this, uh, I think actually as you look at it very plainly, I think there is a way when you describe this that it has to me an evangelistic way to it. I think when you see it, it discloses things about God and about the devil and about his plan that makes the cross even make more sense. So, all right. The hidden mystery, God's secret plan. It's very clear, and he says, no, the wisdom we speak of, the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would have not have crucified our glorious Lord. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. There's something, when he's talking about, the only thing he talked about was Jesus Christ crucified. No one had ever imagined it. No eye had heard it, no mind has, has, has ever imagined this, and so we're driving this home, and so here's the deal, what's the secret? What's the hidden plan? What, what was hidden? Because we have all, all of these scriptures. We know that we have this prophecy where it's foretold. And, and now Brian's done teaching. Well, it's amazing how the prophecies of the Bible are just accurate. And they are spot on and they're amazing. It comes down to two things. And we have this idea of this concept of the suffering servant and the Messiah. Right? Jesus Christ, the Messiah who was crucified. So we see this, and obviously this will make a lot of sense to us. And so we see the suffering servant comes out in, in the songs of Isaiah, and we see things in Psalms where it's clear that we have this, this idea of that he's going to come into this world and he has no stately form or majesty. He lives in obscurity. He's rejected by the people and dies badly. But his death is redemptive like a guilt offering, and he is raised from the dead to leave many people to God in glory, right? The first coming. And then we have 
this second camp. And so without, when you look at through the entirety of Old Testament prophecies, you see this very distinct suffering servant prophecies. They're very distinct. And then we have these other set of very distinct prophecies and about the reigning Messiah, the ruling king who banishes in his enemies and lives forever, right? And so for us, it makes total sense for us. And even for people who aren't believed, they, they kind of get this gist, right? Yeah, I get it. Jesus died on the cross, atoned for your sin. He was raised from the dead, and someday he's coming back again. I think it's pretty well accepted, and people understand that's kind of what we believe. Right, and that's what it's all about. And have you ever noticed, like, when you know something and you read something, or if you have a fact, and then when you go back, is like everything kind of gets informed on that. And so, if you look at us today, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Suffering servant, Jesus died for the sin, and he's going to come back again, and he's going to be the reigning Messiah. Perfect sense, right? What were they looking for at the time of Jesus? When Jesus was alive and previously, the whole period before then, what were they looking for? We have these prophecies. What were they looking for? This. A reigning Messiah. The ruling king who banishes his enemies and lives forever. That was it. They were not looking for the suffering servant. They were looking for this reigning Messiah, the king who would banish his enemies and live forever. That is the only thing they were looking for. Wow. Why is that? When we look on these passages of the suffering servant, they never say Messiah. Okay? They never say the actual word Messiah. So when we look at the Messiah prophecies, right, which is the ruling king, they always say Messiah. That's why they're called the Messiah prophecies, right? Makes sense. But in the suffering servants, it never mentions Messiah there. Okay? Also, the Old Testament never teaches the Messiah will come twice, the second coming. So what we looked at previously and know so well is the suffering servant and the reigning Messiah, right? The Old Testament never taught this whole idea of the second coming. What happens today, and if you will talk to Jewish scholars today, and if you will talk to Jewish people today, is they will point these two things out, and they will call this thing, and they'll say, they, they take issue with it, and they say that putting the suffering servant together with the Messiah, they call this a prophetic gap. There's a hole in it because your suffering servants never say Messiah. And so they have a problem with that. And they say it requires an acceptance of the prophetic gap. But here's, and I in seminary had heard there are lots of theories about this and, and you can talk about why they do this or whatever, but they gloss over it. But here's what Dennis McCallum talks about in this paper and a number of other individuals that he quotes and what makes absolutely perfect sense now that I've read it, Brian has read it, and, and the study, if you want to do this, is amazing, is that not only does the this material and these prophecies not only make it difficult to understand at the time of Christ, but actually impossible to understand. They couldn't have understood it. So when they were looking for the reigning Messiah, they were right. They were looking for the king who would come for Israel and rule forever. They had it right. question is, how can that be? I look at the question, she's like, say what? How can that be? There's something here that I want to point out that made a lot of sense to me. So we have this idea of suffering servant, right? Dies on the cross. He's wounded for our transgressions. He's going to die. We see it all over the Old Testament. It never mentions it. In fact, it's always obscure. What does that mean? It's confusing. Now, the Jewish people in Israel at the time, they always viewed, oh, we're the suffering servant, right? So it meant us. If you read those, it doesn't refer to Israel. It's talking about an entirely different thing, although it is obscure, meaning it can be confusing, and it was intentionally confusing. But in every single instance when he talks about the suffering servant, that prophecy, it's always obscure. In every single time the Messiah 
ruling king who rules forever is mentioned, it's always crystal clear. And one of the things being an attorney is we want to look at things and we want to say if they make sense is he talks about this. This pattern is so consistent, so lacking in any exception, exception that it demands an explanation. And he asks the question, why didn't God just make it obvious, right? Why wouldn't he have said, okay, the suffering servant is going to die. He's going to then atone for the sins and then there will be a, he's a second coming and that's when the ruling Messiah would come. It makes sense, right? Wouldn't you think that he would lay it out perfectly? In fact, it's odd. This is what he says there. Is that I think there is one and only one answer to these questions. God created this situation deliberately. God's secret plan. The mystery that was previously hidden, and it was the mystery that Jesus Christ crucified, that the suffering servant would die on the cross, atone for sin, be raised from the dead, and then there would be a second coming when he would be the reigning Messiah. All of the prophecy will come true. And you ask yourself, why would God create this situation deliberately? Why would he obscure it? Why would he need to hide it? Why was it previously hidden? Even though he knew from the beginning of time, that was his plan for salvation. And even though when we look at all of the prophetic material, and it's awesome, particularly in this new light, it clearly makes sense that he's talking about Jesus. But now that you realize all of that stuff was deliberately hidden, why? We all know at the very beginning of the fall that there's an equal force at work here. It's called Satan, right? Why would a creature as brilliant as Satan not just allow Jesus to be crucified, but actually insisted in doing the very thing that would be the most destructive thing to himself. We know in Luke 4, he talks about that Satan was a careful reader of the scriptures, right? And this is the plain, simple thing. If he had said very plainly and very simply, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to send Jesus into the world. He's going to be a Messiah, and he's going to be murdered on a cross. And in that murder, in that act, he's going to take on the sin of the world, save humankind. I'm going to raise him from the dead to prove that I am God. Okay, He's going to come to heaven, but I'm going to come back again and make things right. Had he said that very plainly, I want to ask you a question. Would, G would, would Satan have gone to Judas and had him murder Jesus? Would you? If you're sitting there and you know the one thing, like, I want this thing, that Satan opposes God at every step of the way, right? He's always there. He was in the mountain, and we're gonna, or he was in the, the garden, and we see these things. And this just makes sense to us. If he knew the one thing, the way for God to save mankind was through the suffering servant and the first and second coming, would he have played his part in killing Jesus? Ain't no way. It had to be deliberately hidden. We even see Jesus when he talks about, and we're going to blow this up, but there was a time around the Last Supper where he says, now we got to stop talking because the, he knows that the, the demon Satan is coming around. He's keeping this stuff secret, and it only makes sense. The brilliant bitter and arrogant enemy of God acted freely thinking he was disrupting God's plan to take over and rule the world through Jesus. But instead he played directly into Jesus' hands doing exactly what Jesus wanted him to do and proving in the process his own character as hate, Satan's character as hate, as well as God's character as true self-giving love. simple. It makes sense. God had to deliberately hide it or else Satan would not have played his part in the resurrection. Here's the other thing that I love about this. Right? And you say Satan's unique role in this is 
there's another reason that makes plain and simple sense. What do we know about the devil? What do we know about Satan? Diabolos equals slanderer, right? The devil gets most of his power and did at this time in his world by creating suspicion about God. From his first appearance, he was implying God can't be trusted and that he is self-serving and oppressive, right? He postures God as mean, oppressive, and unfair. Any God who would judge can't be loving. He continually plays off God's love against his justice. You can't be just and love at the same time. And he portrays God as vindictive and hateful. Like right out of the gate, when the fall happened, he comes to Eve and he's like, well, he just doesn't want you to eat of that because you could be like him. You'll know, you'll, you'll think like him, right? He's... He's vindictive. He's mean. He wants to hold you down. He's not letting you be the same you. He wants you to follow him? What is wrong with this guy? He wants you to worship him? Whew. How can he judge? If he's going to judge and he has all these rules, isn't that just mean? When I take that and I think about that today, don't we hear those same things today? If God's so loving, how could he judge this? How could he do this? Don't we hear that today? Don't we hear that accusation? Man, I have felt that too. And I still to this day, I see certain things and I can get confused. I can, the slanderer, the lies can distract me at times, right? If you hide the secret plan, the devil since the very beginning is trying to slander God Get the lies. Get the accuser. And he believes this, by the way. He believes God. The reason why he left, he thinks he's mean and vindictive. He doesn't want to follow him. He doesn't get it. He sees him as an oppressor. He believes those things with everything he has in his being. Right? And when he sees, okay, this Jesus, there's some authority in him. Like some of the demons, when they showed up, why are you here so early? They were like, this wasn't the time they... They noticed it, but there were things that were happening going on there. And if you're the devil and you think the reigning Messiah, that the Messiah has to live forever, what do you do? You kill him. And he thinks he's going to win, but here's what happens. If Satan was mistaken about Jesus' intentions, he would naturally conclude that arranging to kill him would short-circuit the planned kingdom. I'm going to stop the Messiah because he's not going to live forever, right? Suddenly, his actions with Judas make sense, but what was the outcome? Too late, he would realize that he had actually facilitated not the destruction of the kingdom, but the salvation of humankind. At the same time, his greatest weapon, his accusations of God were now useless. The cross demonstrated in an undeniable way the loving and sacrificial nature of God. Instead of God being vindictive and cruel, it was Satan who was unmasked as utterly vindictive and cruel. The language, and this is plain language, that Dennis talks about is when God set this plan up, is he, he knew he was going to give the ultimate smackdown to the devil. Smacked him down. You want to call me vindictive, mean, and cruel? You have no idea who I am. But I want to tell you this, and what is, what is the picture of the cross? It is anything but vindictive and cruel. I'll read kind of the end of this paper where Dennis puts this together and he says, as we want, as we ponder the mystery hidden for Aeon's past, this mystery hidden in 1 Corinthians 2 that he's been revealing to these people by the Spirit, the multitude of information begins to congeal, which means come together into a marvelous picture. I would suggest that God wanted to create Personal beings, and personal beings by definition, must be unprogrammed, free-choosing moral agents. We all know that, right? Anything less is a machine, not a person. We're not machines, we're people. Yet the creation of freedom inherently entails the possibility and indeed the likelihood that eventually someone would use their freedom the wrong way. We know this happened when Satan rebelled against God, and that rebellion has spread to our world, nearly ruining it. Of course, God saw all this coming, and he had a plan. He laid down a well-attested scriptural tradition 
I want you to hear this. It is a well-attested scriptural tradition. And I will, I will tell you, do not be afraid of getting into the word. I will not let you down. You can count on it. Do not be afraid as it comes to this to go deep. I know sometimes it's like, well, I got to leave my mind at the door because of all this evolutionary speculation which has been disproven and all this stuff that you want to hear out there. Don't be afraid of the scriptural tradition. I promise you, if you press into that word, it's going to give you a wisdom that goes way beyond the foolishness that man is going to tell you. And as it relates to the secret that was hidden, it's clear. That he promised would one day intervene to return the world to its proper state with him as its leader. But he inserted into the same predictive material was another message. A message that was clear in one way. It is crystal clear now. I promise you after Jesus' resurrection. But hidden in another way almost like it was a code. Then at the right time Christ came. And basically laid a trap for the enemies of God. As they pitted their limited wisdom against his infinite wisdom. They were completely outclassed and ended up proving how good God is and how bankrupt was their own revolution. The outcome is clear. The cross, Jesus Christ, crucified, has silenced for all time the ravings of Satan and his ilk. In light of what has happened, the universe can feel an amazing level of confidence in God and in his character. Confidence so complete that revolution will never again taint the course of eternity future. The cross. Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel. He's crucified. He's a suffering servant. Feel the love in that? The sacrifice in that? The pain, the torture, the sin, the what that is. See, you know what, you know who would do that? You know what God worth serving? It's not Aphrodite. It's not Zeus. You want to serve a God? You want to know what the sort of person that you would want to serve that is worthy of serving? It's a God that would go to the cross and would die this agonist death for you. <clears throat> that, is, that is amazing. The cross, God's wisdom, stands out against anything else that we see. Okay? Any of these old coexist, everything else you see, the cross is singular. It stands out, and it is wisdom. And I know people will call it foolishness and will look at it foolishness. I tell you one thing. If I'm going to serve something in this universe, you know what I want to serve? Something that would sacrifice everything for me, for us. When Paul came to talk to them, focused on one thing and forgot everything else. It was Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. As I go back and read and you're like, I want to show you some examples. Well, how does this come alive now? So if you, I didn't know this before this week, okay? I went to seminary, I had the stuff. This had not been illuminated in me, but as soon as I found this out, God had hid this plan intentionally so they would carry out the murder of Jesus, smacking down the devil. But all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, when we start reading the Gospels, why is this important to us, right? When you think about the disciples now, and you understand, you notice how when we read, every time we're reading the Gospels, like he's trying to explain something to them, and he's kind of speaking, he calls it figurative, and they're like, I don't get it. And he goes, listen, I'm going to tell you this now, so when it happens, I'm calling my shot, when it happens, you'll understand, and they're like, what you talking about, Jesus? They couldn't get it, right? They couldn't quite understand it. And when you say, it's time for me to go, I'm getting ready to go to my father's house, and they're like, okay, whoa, whoa, 
wait a minute. Where are you going, Jesus? We don't understand this. You know why they couldn't understand it? They were looking for the reigning Messiah. The reigning Messiah lives forever and banishes the enemies. They, it was secretly hidden. So when Jesus kept saying they saw him, Peter saw him as the Christ. He said, he goes, Peter, what do you, who do you think I am? You're the Messiah. All right, you said it on, your, on you. You're the rock on which I'm going to build your church, my church. But what they were looking for was the reigning king that would rule forever. And so now when we see how the disciples, when you read this now and you understand when they have confusion around him, when he's saying, I'm getting ready to go, and they're like, say what, Jesus? Where are you getting ready to go? Now you know. Now you know. I think one of the amazing things is in Luke where uh, he talks about how he's going to talk to them figuratively before he's preparing them. And he says, I'm preparing to leave. And what he's preparing to go do is become the suffering servant on the cross, right? They couldn't understand this. Deliberately hidden secret of God, and he's like, okay, I'm getting ready to do this, but at some point, you're going to understand this, and I'm telling you these things, and he says, right now I'm speaking to you figuratively, so in a way, so you'll kind of understand it, but soon I'll be able to tell you plainly. And we see in Luke, this come to life when he talks about this, and so then he, and this is after he's now been resurrected, so he's come back to the disciples he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer. He's putting Messiah together with the suffering servant for them. That's what he's plainly talking to them about, okay? Where are you at in Luke? Luke 46, 24, 46. Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from, from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority and the name to all the nations. Right? And then he talks about sending the Holy Spirit. When we look at this, it's clear. I also want to think about, here's another thing that we think about the disciples. Have you, have you ever just felt the weight and the depth of Jesus is crucified and he's died and they abandon him? They leave him, right? They go away sad and destroyed. I always thought it was just kind of some sort of personal failing that they didn't get it. They were looking for the reigning Messiah. They believed in Jesus and Messiah died. Messiah doesn't die. They couldn't know. It was deliberately hidden by God. And just think about this. All you have, you've rectified him as the Messiah. You left everything you had to follow him, your family, your money, your stuff, and you're following him and you believe in he's the Messiah and he goes on the cross and he dies? Wouldn't you be crushed? Wouldn't you go home to your house and just like, I just believed in this. Everything I thought to be true, the reigning Messiah who was going to rule forever is dead. This was deliberately hidden, folks. It was, a, it was a secret message. This was part of God's plan. And so I think when I give you those examples, now you know this is why this is really awesome stuff. It helps us to understand the disciples better. It helps us to understand Scripture better. It, better. And when I look at Acts 2, here's the amazing thing, right? So we talk about in Luke where he says, I'm going to talk to you about it figuratively, but then I'm going to tell you plainly. And we see in Luke where I just read to you, he plainly said, okay, here's the deal. I'm opening the scriptures up to you. Suffering servant, that's me, the Messiah. First coming, second coming. And they're like, whoa. Whoa. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. God came in and blew their minds, right? So we see that in Luke, and the same writer of Luke is the writer of Acts. At the very beginning of, beginning, beginning of Acts, in Acts 1-4, he says, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, 
but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 5, so when the apostles were with him, after seeing him actually alive, they're proving he's alive, they see the resurrected Christ. Luke, the guy who wrote Luke, also wrote Acts. We know he explained plainly, Messiah, suffering servant. We see that language, plain, simple. Here's what, the, this is what the disciples do. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Reigning Messiah! It had been so ingrained in them that they were looking for reigning Messiah, reigning Messiah. Jesus comes and opens it up. And they still are asking. They kept asking him. So this isn't like they asked once. Like they didn't send Peter in from time. Hey, Lord, uh, is this this whole reigning Messiah? No, they kept asking him, which is like, okay, great, great. Uh, suffering servant, this is awesome. You're alive. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Jesus. Now are you going to reign again? Have you ever been so held in tradition and belief that you get blinders on? We're in the political season right now. I'm not going to get into this, but I would just say this. I would say that this isn't something that could happen. You get so ingrained in what you believe that you'll just be a red person right down the line or you'll be a blue person right down the line and you're come hell or high water, you've got your stake in the sand and you're not going to move. They were looking for reigning Messiah, and they're in the midst of Jesus, and they still couldn't quite get it. But something changed in them. As we go on to read in Acts 2, that's where the Holy Spirit comes. And so Jesus, after they're asking him repeatedly, reigning Messiah, you're coming, reigning Messiah, right? We're looking for the reigning Messiah. He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, but they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling the people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, you know those people we hate, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. And they go and they wait. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. And three-time doubting Peter, who's part of the crew, asking, what's this all about? What's this about? Once they are filled with God's spirit, they finally get it. They finally get it. See, there is this thing, we know the resurrection, but there's something else that has to happen here. And it is the filling of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And when we see what Paul talks about after he talks about the hidden, mis the hidden mystery, as he jumps right in, we started, he relied on the Holy Spirit, and he comes down. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. People, the disciples that live with him needed to be filled with the Spirit of God. You guys know this? No one can know you. I, no one knows your story. No one knows your story. No one knows your story of the pain and the suffering that you go through and, and the joys and the things we try and search for words. People don't know those things that you don't share and all of those things. No one can know you and no one can know God's Spirit except for his own spirit and Paul is coming right down this hidden mystery this thing that he's saying he's saying listen he's bringing them back home and he's like this was simple I didn't use smoke and mirrors I just relied on God's spirit and they didn't get it the rulers of this world which would include Pontius and those but the ruler also saying they didn't get it right but he's bringing them back and he's like you know remember this was revealed to us, but it was revealed to you. God's Spirit revealed to you these things. He's taken them back to that simple moment. They've fallen away, and he's like, God has given you this revelation. You know. And they want to question him, and they want to call it foolishness. And the Jews want to call it a stumbling block, and they're coming at you, and the Jews are saying, you're believing that Paul guy? He's an idiot. 
The Messiah is the reigning ruler. I can't believe he's saying this, and I guarantee they were showing him all the scriptures. It didn't say this. You knew God's Spirit told you this. To the man who would see that as foolishness, your God would die on a cross? That's crazy. You're an ass. You knew. And in 12 he says, And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, not the doubting Spirit, not the questioning Spirit, not the lying Spirit, we have received God's spirit, not the world spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. He's a suffering servant. To Revelation. See, in the cross is the wonderful things of God. And when I want us to hear today, and I want you to know, if you are pressing in and recognize the reality of the Holy Spirit in your life, I want to tell you, it is real. In Acts 2, when Peter talks about at Pentecost, and they're like, they see these people speaking in different languages, he preaches the Christ crucified, the gospel, and they're cut to the heart by the Spirit, and they go, what do we do? And he says, repent, be baptized, and you will also receive this Holy Spirit. And it's not just for you. It's for those that are far off. You know who's far off? Us. What the world sees as foolishness. What the Jews today still see, what is their stumbling block. That's all Paul had to talk about. That's all we have to talk about. That's all we have to focus on. And in all of human history, it is the great, it's the greatest case for the existence of God. It shows his character and the reality of him. This is the God you will serve, the God that will do that. It's not the God of money, right? It's not the God of make up whatever you want to do so I can do what I want to do and live how I want to live. No, a God that would do this, that would die for us and would suffer us, that is a worthy God. That is an amazing God. And because this happened, his plan was that he would send his spirit and pour it out onto us so that we can know him, that we would have a comforter and an advocate, that we would have a teacher, that we would have a healer, that we would do greater things than Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, which is alive and well in this world today. It was a simple and plain message. Jesus lived. He was a man. He was God with us. He came. History doesn't dispute that. He was murdered on the cross. History doesn't dispute that. He died. But the amazing reality is that he lives today. And he died for our sins. And he sent his spirit into this world for us. A simple message. A plain message. If you're hearing this in a new way today, if, if you've been cut to the heart, if it makes sense, I want you to know that that is amazing. If that's happened and we need to pray for you and we need to do something, we need to baptize you, whatever we got to do, we're going to do it. But if you're here today and you're a believer, and you're a mature believer and you've heard a new thing, I would just tell you that I hope that you take this and as you're cut to the heart that you don't get lost in the things of this world and you don't do that. You grab a hold of this for the first time and you go pursue the word of God and you get filled in his spirit. Because in knowing that, as Paul says, you're going to know the deep secrets of God. That knowing that you've always wanted in your life, that hole you've always had, it's available for you today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today.
God, I just pray that whatever I shared was not truth, that it would be ripped away from the hearts and minds of people today. Father, I prayed that what was yours today, what was your word, what was your spirit, what was your truth, that it would sink deep into the marrow of our bones, Father. That, that we would live in it as the reality. And Father, we thank you that your plan, that your secret plan, was that you would come and die for us. That you would unmask the lies and show that you are a worthy God. And you are a loving God. And you are a sacrificial God. And we are thankful for your grace and your reality. Father, help us to recognize and live in your spirit and teach us the deep things about you so we can know you, Lord. We pray all this in the name, in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, who was crucified. Amen. Amen.